<laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Abel Contemporary Gallery. I'm Teresa Abel, and I'm here with George Shipperley. And we are in front of a live audience, and we are going to talk about George's career, his techniques, and the wonderful new work in his current solo show that's up through July 17th. The show is called Impressions. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> so um, for those who don't know, I'm just going to give you a little bit of George's background. Um, George has been a practicing professional artist since the early 90s. George's training has included courses at the Art Institute of Chicago, the Palette and Chisel Academy in Chicago, as well as private studio studies with artists including Marianne Grunewald Spagen and Ruth Van Sickle Ford. He is a well-regarded art, art instructor and a member of the Palette and Chisel Academy in Chicago and the first awarded signature member of the Oil Pastel Society. Um, so, I know some things about you, but I think let's just start. What do you know? Because <laughs> over dinner we've talked, I know. Um, so you've been an artist most of your life, mm -hmm. but there was a period of time when you were young. You married quite young. Quite young. Um, to your beautiful and charming wife, Lois. Thank you. And you have three beautiful children. Mm -hmm. And now you have six beautiful grandchildren. Mm -hmm. But life as an artist is hard. And so there was a period in your career where you were a professional salesperson. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then you were finally able to retire from that and be an artist full time in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So, um, how did you manage to keep, did you, were you able to make work? when you were in that other profession and the kids were little, you know, how did you manage that? And when were these, when did the studying happen? <laughs> well, it was difficult. Yeah. We would, uh, I was in the military and we came back from Germany. We already had one child and we had a second one and a third one and always wanted to be an artist. Uh, but you know, <laughs> artists sometimes don't make a lot of money when you're raising three kids, you have to have a guaranteed type of income. So I uh, did as much painting as I could for a while. And I took some courses uh, on the weekends because I did a lot of traveling for this corporation. And that was difficult because I, when I came home, I had things to do when I was at home. So I didn't get a lot of time to practice my craft. Uh, but I knew in the back of my mind, that someday I would be able to, and that went on. I think I think it was thirty four years. I was in, uh, I worked I was working for the Michelin Fire Company, and I was telling the couple. I came home one weekend, and I said to my wife, I said, you know, if I'm ever going to get good at this stuff, I have to stop working and I have to concentrate on my art. I need to work every day. I says otherwise, this is going to be a loss. I said, so I decided I'm going to retire early. And she was very receptive. And I said, of course, you have to continue to work. <laughs> <laughs> she did. She had a gallery and a frame shop that she had for many years herself. And it was a gamble because I actually cut my retirement in half. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and our kids were grown. And that, of course, that gave me the opportunity. And, I, and it worked out very well. I never regretted it. Uh, I had the confidence in myself that I just know I needed to practice this. And uh, it, it proved out to be very successful for us. And I'm grateful for my wife continued. And she does all the framing. She had a, a gallery of her own for many years. And that helped. And then it was just one thing happened after the other. And you started, you know, sort of humbly, like a lot of artists do, right? You did street art fairs. Yes, I did the art fairs. You know, and then, you know, that's, it, and that's such an interesting way to start because you get immediate feedback. Absolutely. You know, I know a lot of young artists can start that way, and it's a really tough thing to do. You really put yourself out there. But, you know, I feel like in that kind of environment, people just say whatever they're really thinking. And sometimes it's kind and sometimes it's not. But <laughs> yeah, it can be a really good learning ground, I think. It's excellent. It's yeah. excellent. And I did that for, I, I was going to originally do it for five years, and I did it for seven years. But 
the good thing about it is you had a chance to meet so many people who love buying artwork and are interested in art, and, and artists that just want to talk to other artists, and it was really great. Uh, and that actually gave me the exposure to go to a gallery like Abel uh, and, and offer my work. And I had a little bit of a background, and I knew I had some customer bases throughout. And that was a good start. And, uh, but after a while, it, it, after a while, you have to stop because it's hard work. Uh, you're up against the weather elements, and you have to do. If you want to expand that, then you have to actually travel. I don't want to do that. I wanted to do just a local show, and that gave me the idea of just contacting uh, a gallery like Abel. I'll never forget walking in the <laughs> because I was told not to do that. It's like I take a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anyone. No. <laughs> the artist will just start running in the door. Yeah. Um, well, and you were smart too. I mean, you came in, we, we've been working together for a long time. Oh, yeah. So well, the truth is, sometimes for artists watching, like if you come to a gallery when they're just starting and they're building their stable, they're more likely to say yes because they're looking for artists. And you came in at a perfect time. So, you know, when you came in, I thought, wow, this guy, I knew right away that the work was so terrific. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was, it was a good time. We were, still, we were still building the stable and, you know, looking for talent like you. So that's great. Um, and, and so as you're developing your work, taking some workshops, you have developed a way of working with oil pastel, which, as far as I know, it's not that no one else would work that way, but you have a very unique way of working. Yeah. Um, you work on thick uh, acid-free boards. Mm -hmm. And you, I think that there's techniques that you use that meld oil painting techniques and even some printmaking and drawing techniques, which I find mm -hmm. are interesting. Mm -hmm. You're sort of scoring into the boards. Um, I, and the way I think it's akin to printmaking is you, and then you put the oil pastel on and wipe it away, almost like you're inking and etching clay. So you get these really fine lines that people don't normally get with oil pastel. But through doing that, you're also building up an atmosphere and you're scraping away and taking oil medium and working it in, right? Exactly. So how did you, I mean, was there an aha moment? I mean, how did you um, navigate doing that? Doing that. Accidentally. Uh, you like to say, no, I created this, but it was it actually it was an accident because I did, did have to scrape, you know, when you, when you use oil pastel and you make a mistake, the beauty of it is you can just scrape it off, unlike a watercolor. And so I would be scraping, and and in the course of doing it, I would gouge, you know, gouge the, the board. And then when I put the, went back to paint again and put the oil pastel on, I said, oh my gosh, I'm getting all these beautiful lines. And it was an accident. And I thought, well, this is going to work out fine. And that's how it happened. And I shouldn't tell all these secrets. <laughs> but that's how it happened. But then you, then you have to develop it. You have to learn how to manipulate that razor blade. And it, it becomes an art after a while. It's not so easy. Uh, but it worked out well because I like fine lines. And I like simplicity. And if you want simplicity, a fine line is a good avenue to simplicity. And uh, so that, that was an accident, but it's, uh, it's beneficial. And I know we were talking about this earlier, um, which I think is interesting. Even now when you're working, there's this real experimentation to what you're doing. And this is a still life, but this could have started as a landscape. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so talk right. a little bit about your approach in your studio, which again, I think is really, um, really interesting because you don't sit down with sketches, pre-sketches, or an idea that I'm necessary, or you might think, maybe I'll do a landscape today, mm -hmm. but then it becomes something else. Talk about all of that. Well, that, you know, and it's, it's, it's not a, um, I'm not a conventional artist, obviously, because I don't do sketches, and only because I'm kind of lazy when it comes to that, and I think that the sketches kind of become stale to me. And so I do all my sketching in the process. I'll start out with when I was telling some, one couple, yes, that um, I was doing, my wife was upstairs and I, my studio is downstairs and she would come down and I've got some landscape going and I'm kind of happy with it. And uh, she, oh, this is kind of nice. And then 
an hour or two later, she might come back down and tell me it's time to come up and have dinner. And there's a snow white on there. And it, it just happens that way. If I decide that I don't, and that's, that's because I don't sketch. Now, and you can, you can go right back to that landscape. You can scrape it down and, and, and then apply the, the colors again and try to come up with something different. But it's just kind of arbitrary. It's just, well, okay, let's, let's try something else. In this particular case, this was a very traditional floral. And I just broke it down. I thought, you know, this is traditional. So I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to break that down. And that's what happens. You just kind of put it through a colander, if you will, to get this essence. And that's how I got started on this type of thing. And do you, when you're doing the still life, do you set up the still life? No. It's all in your head. All in my head. It's you know, because it's the still life uh, can be, you know, can be a nice presentation, but if you if you want to concentrate on design, design isn't something that you're looking at necessarily. Design is what you create, and so I have that freedom. I mean, it's, it's just it's a it's a freedom to do whatever you want to do. But uh, you can see what all I was interested in was the design and, and the flow of, of letting the eye travel within those design elements. Uh, but no, there's, I don't, when originally, when I was doing oils, I started to set up the still whites, and I thought, this takes too much time. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that anymore. I think it's George Shipperly, the impatient artist. The I impatient can't be bothered artist. with setting up yeah. anything or sketching. Yeah. And you could actually, if you have a sense of pottery or something, you could, you could design your own pots and vases <laughs> and what have you, you know, and, and that made it easy for me. But that's also very challenging because when you can do anything. Well, I don't know if I can do anything. Well, but... you know what I mean? When you don't give yourself any parameters, you're not looking at a particular oh, landscape yeah. and you haven't set up a still life. When you sit down there in front of that blank canvas or panel in this case, that can be very intimidating for people to just say, okay, make something. I mean, it's obviously something you've developed now, so you trust that it will become something, but you make it sound a lot easier, I guess. Yeah, uh, then it is. There again, it's because you're not you're not trying to design something or, or, or create something that you're going to transfer to this board. Uh, sometimes, if I do a landscape, I'll start out and just put a line across it. You know, so well, there's my horizon line, and then I'll work on the top and the bottom of it. Uh, it's it's. Uh, I don't know how to really describe it, but I just think it's arbitrary. It's the same way with color. I use arbitrary color. And uh, it's original, <laughs> you know? And I think we all strive for originality. And uh, this is one way to guarantee your originality. It doesn't always work. I mean, I don't know of any artist, and whatever they sit down to do is going to work out because it doesn't. When you look at the, the great masterworks in the museums, I guarantee you they have a lot of them. They never get in a frame. I mean, isn't that the truth? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so they just show their best work out. And you, it is the mistakes that you better yourself by. You, you can't get better unless you make mistakes. Yeah. 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 And sometimes the mistakes, if you pay attention to them, you think they're mistakes, like the yes. gouging into the thing, yes. and it becomes what is your signature style later. If you trust yourself. Yes, if you trust. So true. Yeah. So true. Is that if you trust yourself and you the, the artist recognizes a mistake that they can use. If you're if you're not an artist and you and you go through this process and you want to get rid of all this paint, you're gonna miss an opportunity because in doing so you might find something that's extraordinary in color. But an artist will see, oh my gosh, I've got something that I can work with. And so I like I'm always looking forward to a few mistakes. If I <laughs> so we just talked about how even marvelous artists have to edit pieces and, and the things that maybe don't work out, you don't know that because we're never going to show them to you. But, and in your case, you probably just didn't work them because they're very successful. But I do feel like when you bring a body of work to the gallery for a solo show or for any group show you're in, um, I always feel like every single one just seems like it's exactly what it should be. I mean, I never feel like there's, you know, as a fellow artist, sometimes you look at someone's work and you think, this one's kind of my favorite. I think it's stronger than this one. I mean, that's just the truth. But with yours, I always feel like that one's just perfect. That one's just great. Um, 
But you're How could you not love her? <laughs> <laughs> so but you're very masterful with a few things, like your composition, your eye for composition is terrific, obviously. Your your line quality is great. Um, and then color. So that's what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. Like, I think that you're such a masterful colorist. So talk about your color and your decision making with color, because and a lot of people will say that they'll say, "I just love George's sense of color." Well, for the longest time, my wife kept telling me, "You cannot tell people about your situation with color." But I'm a colorblind, <laughs> and 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 it's, we know when you're a colorblind person, it doesn't mean that every color you can't see. There's different types of colorblindness. Mine is with the reds and the browns and the blues and the grays and the greens and the browns. And it's, you would think that how could you be an artist and be colorblind? The fact is, uh, perfections can be the best part of us, I think, because it taught me to create my own colors and to recognize I me. Mean, when you're colorblind, I think one thing you should do recognize is more values in color. You may not know exactly what they are, but you recognize the different values. And I found that with that and with just experimenting with color and trying my own color schemes, it worked out beautifully for me. Uh, it's when I pick up a pastel, if it's a bright red, I can tell what it is. Or if it's a bright yellow, I can tell what it is. It's when I start to put them on the boards together and I start mixing them and layering them, then I lose track of what the color is. But I always know when it's right. You know, it's not that I have to question myself. I just know that this color works. And uh, I can tell you a story about when I was in the corporate world and I had to wear a tie and a suit and all that. I would come downstairs and we had three daughters that were teenagers. And you know how three daughters, teenagers could be. And they would look at me with my tie and my suit on and look, tell her mother, are you going to let him go out of the house like this? because I might have the wrong tie on or something. And I, that was an entirely different thing. You know, I thought it looked kind of good, but probably with, with the tire it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a really, it was a plus for me. And uh, it really is, and it worked out well. And uh, like I say, I hesitated telling people about that. I can tell you one more story. Yeah, yeah. do. Because I, I think this is fascinating. Okay. When you first told me that, I was completely blown away. Uh, I, I teach and I taught for a number of years and you get to meet a lot of artists and boy, there's nothing nicer than meeting fellow artists and watching them develop their schemes. But this one artist uh, I had not met, but she was told she should take my class and she's Italian and uh, she comes into class and I'm inst instructing everybody to take out a palette, you know, a pre-select your colors. Don't, don't just choose from this smartest board, pre-select the colors that you're going to use and then stick with that to get this harmony. And so I would go around the room initially and I'd look at the, what the artist was doing. I got to her and she had this, this array of colors laid out there. And I says, okay, now what colors have you got here? <laughs> she looked up at me and she says, you don't know? <laughs> and, I, and I says, well, I know, but I says, some of them I can't determine, especially the darker colors. And she says, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> we became good friends. <laughs> you imagine if you like advertise like lessons with George Shipperly. I mean, can you fun. imagine how, how somebody would think coming into a class and you got an artist that doesn't know what the figure of a teacher that doesn't know what the color is? Believe me, I have met people who've taken workshops and classes with you and they just like they've gotten so much out of it. <laughs> well, it just uh, well, Celia knows. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, so really, so when you sit down, you're not thinking landscape, you're not thinking still life, you just make a mark and go from there. Go well, from there, yeah. 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 Or I'll start out with, uh, if I'm doing a, a still life, I'll start. If you notice in my work, I don't like to put a lot of things in with a base of quality. I just like, <coughs> excuse me, I just like that. Uh, because I think it becomes, with the exception of things like this, where it's, it's an altogether different situation. But typically, I like just concentrating on a base with qualities in it and the background. 
Uh, there's times that I will put other stuff into it, but I kind of minimize it. And I, I, the first thing I'll do is I'll determine if there's a table. I just put a line in there. If I want a base, I'll just draw some base that I think I can design, and I do that. And I take it from there, and then I start adding the flowers. Uh, mm -hmm. But everything that I have within these things, this is just all things that I thought, well, if I were going to design a pot, how would I do it? I like long shapes like that. Uh, that's what I do. It's the same way with the landscape. I just I just start putting trees in. I love trees. I love the poetry of trees. And they're easy. Uh, for me, I think they're one of the easiest things of this to paint because they're so beautiful. And um, But I, it's all up here. <laughs> so when did you start teaching? How did that come about? Well, that was accidental also. <clears throat> I was approached by a an art league in DuPage, uh, it's in Wheaton, Illinois, and they said, George, do you ever think about teaching? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I never, I thought to myself, I just don't think I'm a teacher. And they finally convinced me that I should try it, and I did, and I loved it. And then I started teaching in other places. So I do a, a, a workshop at the Peninsula every year. Uh, I teach in Wheaton, and I teach in uh, uh, there's a group of oil pastelists in Aurora area, Chicago area, that's about 50, and I teach them four classes a year. This is the last year I'm teaching. Oh, I decided I have to give that up because I want more time to paint. But I love teaching because it's like painting. You, you, you're watching an artist develop a painting that you are helping that artist with, and it's just, there's a joy in it and then to see the success that they had. So I really enjoyed it, but I just can't do it anymore. Uh, at least I don't think I can. So far, I decided to give it up. We'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. We'll, see, we'll see what happens. And I'm assuming that there's times that from that interaction that it brings something to your own work. Oh, yes, absolutely. That, that's an interesting point that Teresa brought up. I learn from the students. I mean, don't we all learn from each other as artists? I mean, they do something that just blows my mind, and I think, well, I think I could try that. But I also learn from them, so it's it's a two-way street, a win-win situation. So to speak. Yeah. Are there particular artists that that you find most inspiring to your work, and yes. has that changed over time? Well, it does because you know there's always new artists coming out, but um, Corot was one of the first artists that inspired me. I just I just couldn't believe the magnificence of his work. I love the sensitivity of it. I love the, the, the tonality of it. Uh, I also like the impressions. I mean, you can see some of my work that it's, uh, it made an impression on me. <laughs> and uh, I learned from them. I learned looking at their work. I just love it. You know, when you, when you love looking at a piece of artwork, and, and you are yourself an artist, you think, well, how can I do something? I think we all do that. I think we all, all artists are influenced by other artists, are they not? Of course, yeah. And, uh, and, and those are the, I think, the, the Impressionist and Corot, but also um, Innes. You're familiar with Innes? An incredible artist. And, and he actually went through the majority of his life not even being recognized as a, as a reputable artist. Today, he's just admired all over the world. And it, and it, was, it is that, that feeling, that tonality, that um, just mystery of, of the work that they do. Now, I don't know if it shows in mind because you, you take that and then you add whatever you're going to add to it as an artist yourself. But they did influence me quite a bit. Well, and I think I was just doing a studio visit with another artist recently who's going to be in an upcoming show. And we got into a conversation about how sometimes when you're, especially when you're younger, I think, and you're, and you're building figuring out who you are as an artist, mm -hmm. you might admire a kind of work that ends up not being what your work is about at all. And for instance, like I'm a painter and I I thought when I was young, I wanted to be Francis Bacon or Mark Rothko or something. And my work is nothing at all like that. You're saying no. Yeah, like it's not at all. <laughs> you know, it's very tiny right. sort of little. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and she was having the same thing. Like she thought she wanted to be a whole different thing. and. And so eventually you sort of, if, you're, if you stick with it, you become yourself. You do. Um, so I'm always, it's always interesting to hear because if you had said something like, 
I was influenced by Rembrandt, I wouldn't be surprised, or because you never know. No. Because eventually, you like you just sort of down that path, you become whoever you're really supposed to be if you really listen to where the where the work's going. That's interesting because you're right. You, you, you can. I could have been influenced by Rembrandt. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's different artists that affect you differently, uh, either in their colors, their design, or any number of things. I think uh, Wolf Kahn, he was one of the later artists that really impressed me. And for his color, essentially, uh, I don't paint anything like him, but I just blew my mind when I saw his color. And, and all these things collectively form your own. It, it's like it's like all these, uh, what would you call them? tangible arms coming in at you with all different ideas and now all of a sudden you create something from all those ideas. Uh, every, I think every artist uh, has learned from others. And that's just part of it. It's an ongoing thing. It's, it's, it's evolving, isn't it, in the arts? Yeah. yeah. It is. And then every now and then someone comes up with something that's completely different. And, and then the rest of us say, well, how can I do that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Just, it's good just to be yourself, be an original, and be influenced by other artists, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then another thought that I wanted to ask you about, and this is because I, I think sometimes there are these um, romantic notions that artists are, you know, wandering around your studio, and when, the, when you feel inspired, that's when you run down and you stay up all night in the studio. But I, but I know how much work goes into, I know that you have a number of galleries, you have deadlines. Ha have you always approached it? Do you have a schedule that you're in your studio, work hours, or do you work when inspiration comes to you? Good. That's a very interesting question because I find that all artists are different about that. I work every day practically in the afternoon, never in the morning, uh, because I kind of gather some thoughts, you know, and think about things. But I always work in the afternoon, anywhere from two to four hours. Uh, depending on my energy level. Uh, but I find that to be the best time for me. And then sometimes if, I, uh, if I'm if i onto something, I might go back to it even after later hours, but not too often anymore. And on occasion in the morning, but mostly it's every afternoon, unless I have an appointment, <coughs> excuse me, that I can't. And I do, I like that for a number of reasons. One is, and you could probably attest to that, when you're in the, when you're in the painting, painting every day, you're in like a, a rail train. I mean, <laughs> you, you are. Yeah. It, it's just with you constantly. When you get out of that and you take a break, you'll find that it's a little difficult to get back into it. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be my case. You know, if, I'm, if we go on vacation and I might be gone for two weeks, uh, I want to come back and paint, but it's a little bit difficult for me to get back into it. But when you're doing it every day, you can't wait till one o'clock comes so you can go back downstairs and paint, you know, because you're just into this. And uh, it, it's it's a passion, isn't it? It really is a passion. Uh, it's an insatiable passion, actually, I think. Yeah. Well, and I think sometimes I'll talk to artists and they'll say, oh, I've been on my studio and got busy for a little while, having a hard time getting back in. And, and the advice I always say is, you know what, that's okay. Even if you don't have an idea, just go sit in your studio. By sitting in your studio and kind of observing the remnants of what you were last working on, I, just being in that space where you are normally on yeah. that yeah. path, yeah. eventually you're, you'll that desire will come back, and then you're back on, you're back yeah, you're at back it. Back you know? it. Yes. Yeah. The worst thing is getting disturbances. You know, when the phone <laughs> rings or something else happens, and you think, oh, <laughs> and so I, but I, I contend with it. I, I have no problem with it, but it, it does break your your thought pattern. We all have to deal with that. You know, I have a private studio, and I'll, sometimes I think I should just close that door, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, I don't do that because we get neighbors that come over and stuff. So. <laughs> it is it's a private thing, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It, it's a private thing, and it's an emotional thing, and it's uh, it's hard to think of anything else when, you, when you're painting. You just can't. Uh, I put some music on, to try to. Well, the excitement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm not the only one here today. So I don't know. We have this um, 
bunch of great people who've joined us. If anyone has any questions, yeah, we can just start to have it's not a huge group, so let's have it. Well, one of the things, like the things you just said, I actually have three questions. One of the first ones was, do you, do you now that you expose yourself to being colorblind, do you, do you, doesn't that encourage people to want to come see what the hell you're doing? I, mean, <laughs> I, I personally don't think that's a thing. I think you should put that on Facebook. <laughs> you will have more work than you want to do. Or that's just the side. I'm just thinking I have two friends that are colorblind, and I'm sending them all. <laughs> I want them to take a look at what you can do. Because they're kind of looking in their mind as if colorblind wasn't a good thing. Well, they might they're find they're it is. Yeah. And I'm like, stop the clock. Not That's funny. The other thing I wanted to ask you too is like, I have found when I'm doing my artwork, sometimes, you know, especially teaching and teaching other people, especially kids, that if, if, if you want to do something to change what you're doing is to switch mediums and, and go to a medium that you are totally not with and you are like less than kindergarten in there you know I mean and you know there's big differences you yeah. know it's like a, if you're working with watercolors you're not going to try to do the same thing that you would do with an oil or what I work in ink and it, you know so it's one kind of a concept of what you want to do but in those actual changing of mediums that's my question for you do you ever do that I mean I love what you do exactly what it is and I agree with you that every single thing that you paint looks like you it's finished with purple. You know, I mean that you were on my Zoom wall when I you know when I had my so what your little pictures back there behind me, you know what I mean? Because I, I to me it's like if somebody's looking and asking to see this is what I think is not this way it work. But do you do that? Do you try to jump out of it to different mediums or is that like scary as all the Jesus? No, 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 thank you for the question. No, I, I have. I, I I started out with the oil paint. And I worked with that for a number of years, and it you know, it was nice, but I just didn't feel totally comfortable with it. Uh, and maybe I just didn't know what I was doing at the time either. I got to say that. And then I went to acrylic. What, what was it that made you go there? Was there something that made you jump to the other? The uh, yes, it, it, I was actually having trouble getting the quality of, of the color. I, I don't know if I was mixing too much. Oh. turpentine with it and I was washing it out too much and it, it just didn't have the life that I thought an oil painting could have and uh, but you know everybody that starts out as an artist thinks well oil paintings what I want to do you know, that, that's the big thing you can't be an artist and not be an oil painter so, <laughs> you can be yeah. you can be you can. Yeah. just ask Teresa <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> then I went to acrylic and at the time I got into acrylics they were kind of new so they really weren't perfected and, and the colors were not that good. And they kind of washed out, I thought. And so I worked with that for a while and it was a little bit easier. And then for some unknown reason, and I can't remember the reason why, somebody suggested to me that I try soft pastel. And I thought, oh, I don't think I'd like to do that. you know. But I did, and I did it for a long time, but I, I got sick because I didn't have the proper ventilation and the oil, the soft pastel. But I said, I said soft ass, so yeah. 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 uh, the dust, and it wasn't getting out of the room, and I was breathing this stuff, and I was finding myself having some trouble. So I thought, well, let's shelf that. And then I went to the to the art supply store, and I saw these crayons, <laughs> you know, and I thought, what is what is these? What are these? And I said, these are oil stick. And I asked the clerk to explain them to me and so forth. I'll, I'll take a set of those. And that opened up a whole new world for me. And was it just, did you feel an affinity to the media? Immediately. Immediately. Well, right. sure, if you have to fill in your gouges. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> right. right. Oh my I'm gosh, I can find the gouge. gouge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just immediately, I, I felt very comfortable with them. And I found that I could do all sorts of different things with them, which I was not able to do with the other mediums. I, I could do so much with these oil pastels. The secret is you have to buy the best. You don't buy what I call the crayons. Uh, you have to buy the best. And if you don't, you're going to find that they are not capable of doing what you are capable of doing. So you, that's the one thing I would, would emphasize uh, because a lot of them, it's just too much wax to them. A good, a good brand is Holbein or Sennelier. And you buy the best. I think any, any artist has, should buy the very best materials available.
And from, and I've been with them now for I think 20 years. Yeah. And I don't know what's left. <laughs> you know, I, I never tried watercolor when I was in high school. And I knew I couldn't do that because I can't correct the mistakes. You know, throwing them on two paper, papers, throwing the paper and going all the time. This is crazy. I like mistakes. You know, so. <laughs> That's, does that answer your question? Yeah, that, then I have one more question too. Yes. And it's about lighting because, you know, in my studies, you know, and I found out that when you mentioned earlier that you you don't draw stuff or have stuff in front of you or anything like that. And I remember having to do that in school. You know, you got, I mean, one of our teachers took all the desks out of the classroom and made this monstrous pile of a hall and had us all go out with our sketchbook. We all want to strangle her. Time. You know, it was just, but you know, and it just it forces your mind to, to do something, something different. But what I found out for me, for especially with, is that Picasso, you know, he painted in the dark. He didn't paint during daylight. He didn't have lights coming in. And I thought that was just fascinating because I thought it was the only person who painted in the dark. Because I'm not painting something that's outside. I'm painting something that's coming from the inside of my mind and coming out. And by the dark, you just mean daylight, not artificial. Yeah, well, the thing is, yeah, I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, literally, like, you know, if, if the ear earliest paintings, I would literally gesso canvases black, completely yeah. black, because I've kind of studied those, the four guys that used to scrape all the black off and then paint behind it. And I thought that was just fascinating to me that that was how they had like textures and stuff, like people clay and stuff, like they'd scratch out stuff. But they started with black, and I was like, what the hell are they talking about? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would try it. But then I realized that that was why the, the best paintings were like exactly what you said to us. You, it's, you're not making a mistake. You're doing the right thing. It's a mistake if you're looking at it from this point looking in. I mean, you think of somebody like Monet who would tie himself to the ground with a string and so the water would be taken away because he was painting outside and trying to catch the light. It's, it just seemed to be neurotic. You know, to have to copy something that was so moving and difficult. And I love his work because he did that, you know. But when I'm thinking, well, why? I thought I was nuts because everything was painted from the inside. So inside in my studio, I have, it looks scary from outside. There's so many lights. I have lights behind me, lights in front of me. I need like a sweatband, you know. <laughs> if I'm working on a big project, all the light has to shine in, and I need to have all of that light so that I can make what I want to pull out of my head, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, and it was the same thing. Some of these are the best things I got from mistakes. Mm -hmm. I remember once, I, you know, because I worked in Egypt, this is really expensive. The bottle was like $9 for this little tiny, but it was the most fabulous color, blue, mm -hmm. you know, and it spilled. I thought it was like a heart attack. I mean, you know, it just spilled all over, and I went, oh my God, I took my squares that I was working on, and I blotted them. I just blotted them wherever the blot went, and I just let it sit. Like there's still like there. I did that again, but that ended up being a series. But it was a creation piece that we all got to use. Colors for someone's house. She had this little narrow wall, and the design house it was beautiful. But she wanted them for that, and she wanted them like sea colors, you know, like corals. And she traveled all over the world, and she had glass from all over. I mean, it's, it's why I don't do commission stuff anymore. Not your question is to, in the what so in your lighting, lighting, right? Yeah. For me, so I could make lighting and I could get back and move fast mm -hmm. as soon as I had the lighting set up like that. It didn't matter what time of day it was, or you know, if, if there was other things that put aside, but I could go in that light. So, do you have natural light? Well, that was I have, I have you... fluorescent light, and you know, you use they say to use the warm light and warm the blue light. light combination. And I don't even do that anymore because some of them burn out. I don't even replace them. Uh, there is a, a something to be said about too much light. I do think, especially uh, with with a, with a painter, because if it's too much light, you're not really getting the depth of the of the color. You're not getting the impact of it. So I will sometimes cut the light down so I can see it in a natural light, and I found that that's beneficial. But every artist has a different idea. I think about light. I say to kind of experiment it with it, but don't overdo it. And I like the fluorescence because they spread it out evenly. And uh, so when you have your lights, is it above you, behind you, where are you? I have them above me. Yeah, I have, above and you. nothing and shine, shines said, immediately directly onto the canvas. They have them all above me. I mean, and you, you paint this way? I stand up 
stand up and came straight out. Right. And then sometimes I'll take one of the switches and I'll turn the switch off so I can see them in different lights. Right. Uh, because it, it can't control you off. If you've ever done a painting and you take it off the easel and you bring it in another room, it's, oh my God, that's horrible. Yeah. You take it right back into the studio. And well, then you, 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 know, you realize so you've yeah. got too much light on it and you're not seeing, yeah. you know. You have to think about, you know, where is this going to be seen? Because, yeah. you know, if um, the thing is that hopefully the home for that painting is going to be in someone's home. Exactly. Um, yeah. And they're not going to have crazy lights shining on it and you know so so you try to have some lighting that's you know representative of where it will end up spending its life so i think that that's maybe not yeah. what we can do. i think that's a good point yes um do you work on more than one at a time that's a good question. do you have a series going or, or or just like a still life and then this totally <laughs> different you know pastoral scene or something or in a building are, are they going at the same time i can't do that I just can't do that because I'm so focused on one thing at a time. Uh, the you know, card. women, women, can, you can all multitask. <laughs> you can. I mean, I, I think that that. But I mean that you you can for some reason a woman can do three or four things at a time. Maybe it's because you are the the, the mother or the wife that has to do all these things. But it blows my mind. I can only do one thing at a time. So. <laughs> So what I do is I, I just work on that painting, and sometimes I get aggravated because I like to go on to something else, but I stay with it. Now, there are times, and Teresa brought up an interesting thing about it, when you see them, they all look like they're just completely done. Well, sometimes I take them out of the frame and I redo them, you know, because I do see something that's wrong with them, you know, and because I don't want to put it into a gallery unless I know it, it, it as good as I can make it. And so... Uh, I have had worked with a few artists like you, and I feel like I've had this conversation with you where maybe there was an image you had sent me, you know, um, we know you're having a show or doing some work for a show and you send me some images months ahead and then you'll say, oh, well, somebody's interested in that one. I, I worked on it, so so tell them it's different from the picture that I sent <laughs> because I, I made Lois take it out of the frame. <laughs> and it happens, yes, it happens, you happens. know, and I'll just say this, this this just isn't as good as it can be. And, and I do that a lot. It irritates my wife, but uh, I do it a lot. And uh, it's because you don't want, you don't want that painting to be viewed unless you are convinced it's everything that you can do to make it as good as you can make it. It's just, it's a, it, it, is it a pride thing or is it just, you just, you just, if you're a professional, you got to look like a professional. Well, no, and I think because, you know, it's because it's what you want to see. Well, that's true. Yes, that's you're not seeing what you yeah. you, you hit the nail on. Yeah, I just I think of that. <laughs> well, you do that. Yeah. Right. Somebody else. Yes. You you mentioned emotion. Could you talk more about that? Because sometimes some some image or something will stop me in my tracks, and I think I'd like to paint that. I like to capture that emotion of whatever it was, whether it was the vibrancy of the colors or whether it was just the way nature put it all together. When you talk about emotion, what what did you, what were you uh, uh, conveying then? Now you're saying like if you see a beautiful scene out there, you, you're attracted to that. And how do you capture it? Yeah, it? well, no, it, it, I mean, you mentioned emotion. I wonder what you meant by yeah. that. That's okay. what I think. But what does emotion, emotion mean to you? What emotion means to me, uh, spontaneity. You know. I, it, it hits, it, it strikes a chord with me. I, I get emotional involved in it. And when you are, there is a rhythm. There is a rhythm to your way of painting that I have found. There's an attitude, if you will. And that attitude prevails, you know, throughout the course of that painting. That's why I don't like working on more than one painting at a time, because I can't just switch my attitude back and forth. And so there's an emotional thing that you have in that painting. It could either be the color that, that's attracting you, it could be the, the shape of a tree that is attracting you. It could be uh, a memory of something that's attracting you. But th there is an emotional attachment to a painting. It's, it's hmm. uh, for the lack of a better term, it's a love affair that goes on between that canvas and you for a period of time. Uh, not entirely, but if <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. You have so many different formats. Do you sometimes start with a 
You know, do you always start big and I'm going to cut this part out because this is where I want to be? Or do you say, today I'm going to do an 8 by 10 and tomorrow I'm going to do, or you know, next week I'll do a 16 by 20. Do you start with a preconceived format or does the idea come first and you think, I'm going to do this, I need something that's this size? Uh, both ways, because when I do the small pieces, like you see some of these squares, those are, squ <coughs> excuse me, those are square clay boards that I buy that's a given size, and I buy those and I know when I pick one up, that's what I'm going to work with. The other part of it is uh, there are times, and I don't know if I want to do a large painting or a small painting, it depends on uh, what I think I need to do, and I have a bunch of my wife being a framer, she has all this acid-free mat board that I use. And I use the, the raw side of it. And it's laying all over my table. And I just pick up a piece and I say, oh, I like the shape of that. And that's what I work with, mm -hmm. you know? And do you ever find yourself altering that size though? Like cutting out, like, you, you know. You mean like, like. Uh, like just, I'm gonna cut out this little, you know, you have this size, but this just looks really good. Yeah, and so I'm you, you cut that say, oh, and that's take my to the map right cutter there. and lop off four inches. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Well, I, I have uh, on rare occasion. Uh, that's so funny because I'm working on a very large painting right now that actually occurred to me the other day. <laughs> you might start doing that. I've got four pieces. Yeah, <laughs> so it occurred to me the other day that I can't. I got all these trees on there, and I can't get the ground the way I. The way I try to visualize it, or I haven't visualized it yet. And I thought, you know what? <laughs> I just cut that <laughs> off. But I did it. I did it. I says, no, if I don't conquer this, I'm not going to learn anything. Mm -hmm. So I stay with it. And I, I, I did finally conquer it. And so you take it as a challenge. It, I take it as a challenge. Mm -hmm. because. But now a lot of artists do. The masters did that. There's a, there's a famous painting. I think it's at the Lusla Trek. It's hanging in the yard, isn't it? You can see where he cut something off and he added something to it. I mean, that's creative in itself, is it not? Yeah. I mean, the, the only thing that counts is the end result. Right. No matter if you sign, start out with a 12 by foot, foot by 12 foot, and you end up with a six by six, it's the end result that counts. And I think artists ha have that privilege to do that. I, I haven't done it because I like to conquer it. What's the largest you've done? What's What's that? The largest format you've done. It was for Teresa, for a customer in New York. Yes. Yes, and it was a 40 by 60, I think. Mm -hmm. you ever try to do a 40 by 60 painting with oil pastel? And I had the hardest time getting a board that was heavy enough that I could do it in one piece. And I thought, you know, probably not going to do too many more of these. <laughs> it turned out great, and they love it. So. Oh, I'm glad they do. Yeah. Yes, I'm glad they do, because <laughs> I took my heart and soul, and I said, this is really going to be a challenge. And whenever you do a commission, it, it's it's really challenging because you you're trying to please a customer that's paying you for this. So you, you're just so involved in making sure that you do your very best, and of course you're always hoping that what you're doing they're going to like. So in some ways it's constricting, but in the, in the long run it's it's a wonderful thing when they do like it. Yeah. Yeah, because you don't watch. You don't want someone to pay for a penny that size that can't stand looking at it. Well, and, and I don't know if you feel this way if you do commission work, but I've, many artists have told me there's this sort of um, strange thing that happens too. You can't help but sometimes worry that you're pleasing someone, but feeling like that person is almost in the room with you mm. can hinder you making the best decisions because you're second-guessing yourself more than uh. you would if you were just... I mean, that's what's happened to me anyway in the past, and other people have told me I don't know if that happens. That's the most critical part, that is, that you're always thinking about the person that's buying it, that they like this. Or they might even tell you in, up front they want certain colors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you imagine what that is for me? You know? and <laughs> so, <laughs> There's a disclaimer. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> But yeah, that, that is, that's part of it because there is a restriction there. What happens if you lose some of your freedom? But uh, commissions are necessary because uh, it's part of being a professional artist. Well, and when we, you know, speak with people who, you know, who are interested in having a commission, which can be a fine thing, and a lot of them oh, yes. are great. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'll always try to say, you know, there's a certain place where give us some feedback, but really if you trust the artist and give them 
could give them a lot of freedom. The truth is you'll probably end up being happier because you'll get a better piece. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's a hard trust thing, I know, but but it, it, it's often true. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not easy, but yeah. necessary. You had a question. Uh, I was uh, thinking in terms of self uh -huh. When you went to the oil pastel, are you still doing that in layers? Yes. Much like a proper Yeah, yeah. Uh, not not everyone. Some some you'll see are in layers. This one here is not layered. This is uh, because I I'm into a new technique now where I use a rubbing technique. I put colors on, and sometimes I'll put multiple colors on. And I'll take this paper towel and I'll rub it into the board, and there's a whole array of colors that takes place. So I'm doing a lot more of that, and that's more of a flat thing like this is. Yeah, but the layers is nice because it's, I don't know, it's exciting to do it. You know, it is exciting to do the paint. You are, if you feel the excitement when you're doing it, it's just like you're in seventh heaven. What is seventh heaven? Anyway? I, know, I'm not sure. I, I just don't even know what that is. Well, that's another show. We're all going to Google that after this. Yeah. 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 The origin of the phrase seventh heaven. Anything else? Well, we need to we need to go on the thank you. Thanks for oh yeah, sharing. absolutely. Yeah. I didn't want to be the first one. Yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Great. Well, something comes up. I mean, George isn't going to run out the door. No. So if you want to talk to him about a specific piece or something, please feel free to you know You're spend welcome. time with the show because it's so great. Thank you. Um, the show is up through July seventeenth. It is also available, there'll be a video walkthrough of the show on the website for George's page, specifically for George's show, and all of the pieces are available to view online as well. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.